Welcome. This is the series uh, the prophets. And uh, in this uh, number three, it is the prophets, the gift. And so welcome that we may share in the word of God again. And uh, I pray that these presentations will move us closer to Christ and know uh, what uh, we are supposed to do, how to defend uh, our Bibles, how to recognize the true and the false prophet, and um, that we may be anchored in truth, we may not be shaken and be tossed about with the uh, winds of doctrine. And so, welcome once again. This is number three in the presentations, the prophets, the gift, and let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, at your own time you make things, Lord, to happen. At the appointed time, Lord, you have said you shall visit your children. And Father, in every visitation, you bring a blessing to us. And so in this hour, at uh, the moment that uh, you have uh, planned that we may study, let this be beneficial to us and to all who shall come across this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the prophets and uh, the gift. We know that uh, when the Lord imparts the Holy Spirit to his children, he doesn't just impart for the sake of the character, but also he imparts for the sole purpose of giving the gifts so that the children of God may be lacking in nothing and the gifts that are given may help them to grow in spirit. I'd like to start with the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians uh, chapter 4. And uh, I'm looking from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4 uh, from verse 7. This is what the word of the Lord says. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some uh, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stage of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, if you notice that... Uh, the sole purpose of giving the gifts is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so if anyone rises today and uh, the gift that they are having, they are not for perfecting the saints, for helping in the ministry and edifying the body of Christ, you may know that these people have not been called into the ministry they are not working for God, but they were, are working for an enemy. Again, uh, the reason for giving the gift also, verse uh, 14, that uh, the gift may help the church to be no more children tossed to and fro and being carried about with the winds of doctrine. And so, one thing you realize that um, the gift will bring the truth and not will bring and not bring about uh, winds of doctrines that are different from uh, what is contained in the scripture in the word of god and so we expect that the doctrines that the people who are having the gifts will have will be in accordance to the word of god and not winds of doctrine to make people uh, a bit tossed uh, about. And that is why we picked on one gift, that is the gift of prophets because prophecy, because 
it is one of the things that Christ warned the church in the end time, we shall have many teachers and many prophets, prophets, and their main work will be to deceive the children of God. And so we have to look keenly at this gift of um, prophecy. Now, um, there's uh, material to cover here. Uh, the uh, one, one reason why the gifts are given to the church is for the communication between God and men. And so let us look at um, some of the things we have when it comes to the communication of God to men, communication of God to men. In uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 48, paragraph 4, and you will say, why are you quoting uh, extra uh, 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 non-canonical materials when we are looking at the prophets have you proved already what you are quote, quoting is truth and we shall be coming to that by the time we come to that you will see that uh, this tallies our first parents through creation created innocent our first parents though created innocent and holy were not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing god made them free moral agents capable of appreciating the wisdom and benevolence of his character and the justice of his requirements, and with full liberty to yield or to withhold obedience. They were to enjoy communion with God and with holy angels, but before they could be rendered eternally secure, their loyalty must be tested. In page 50, paragraph 3, we are talking about God's communication with man. We find that when man was created, there was a direct communication between man and God because they had not seen. In the book of Isaiah 59, we find that uh, it is because of sin that our communication with God have been severed, uh, the direct communication. And so he told the children of Israel, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you and then make a mercy seat. That is where I'll come and commune with you. There was no direct communication, but he used to communicate now through Christ, who was the mediator of the covenant. So before sin and before the end of sin, we find that the communication that God had with man was a direct communication. The holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving instruction from the all-wise creator. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between. They were full of vigor imparted by the tree of life and their intellectual power was but little less than that of the angels again in isaiah 59 verse 1 we find that behold the lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and your god and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear in 1 timothy 6 15 we read which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potent uh, the king of kings and lord of lords who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And so you find that if you put side by side the two verses, you find that we cannot behold the face of God anymore because of iniquity. Our iniquities have separated ourselves with God. And so in PP 67.2, Adam in his innocence had enjoyed open communion with his maker, but sin brought separation between God and man. And the atonement of Christ alone could span the abyss and make possible the communication of blessing or salvation from heaven to earth. Man was still cut off from direct approach to his creator, but God will communicate with him through Christ and the angels. And, um, uh, when you look at uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter um, 1, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, just running ahead of myself, God at a sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in this last day spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made uh, the world. And so God spake, uh, unto the fathers by the prophets. And then he has spoken to us by his son. And then when you go to verse 14, we are told, verse 7 first, and, and 
and of the angel he say, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So ministers are representatives and are uh, a go between one person and the other. In verse uh, 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And so we find that God now after sin speaks through Christ. He speaks by prophets and he speaks by angels. When you go to Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, who God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel and his servant. So you have the revelation coming from God and given to Jesus, who signifies it by his angels, and these things are given to his servants. And so we have Jesus Christ again, we have uh, the angels and we have the servants of God ministering the same. In uh, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one and um, uh, verse twenty one, for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and so we find the ministration of the Holy Ghost to holy men and prophecy coming to men, but. Uh, that was just running ahead of some things. Uh, what I wanted us to establish that after sin, God had no direct communication with man. Sin brought separation. In uh, Signs of the Time, July 31, 1884, paragraph 8, up to the time of man's rebellion against the government of God, there had been free communion between God and man. Heaven and earth had been connected by a path that the Lord loved to traverse. But uh, the sin of Adam and Eve separated earth from heaven. The curse of sin was upon the human race and was so offensive to God that man could have no communion with his maker, however much he might desire it. He could not climb the bat battlements of heaven and enter the city of God, for there were, for there entereth into it nothing that defileth. The ladder... Um, the ladder represents Jesus, the appointed medium of communication. Had he not with his own merits bridged the gulf that sin had made, the ministering angels ascending and descending on the ladder would have held no communication with fallen uh, man, with fallen uh, uh, beings or with fallen man. Now, if God did not communicate with man after sin, what is actually happening in the book of Genesis chapter 3? Let us go to the book of Genesis chapter 3 and see some wonderful things that are going there. Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to notice some things when Adam had seen. Uh, you hear that um, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God. Now, you have to be so attentive to notice what is happening here. They heard what? The voice of the Lord God. They had had an open communion with God, but at this time, they just hear the voice. And we want to see if, according to Isaiah 59, sin separated man with God. How is it that they heard his voice? And in other parts, it says that no one has ever seen his shape, his image, or heard his voice. Walking in the garden. Now, does a voice walk? Really? And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the uh, in the garden, the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. So you have two things happening here. We have the voice of the Lord God walking and then the presence of the Lord. Think about that for a minute. What is the voice of the Lord? Christ is the voice of the Lord or the thought of God made audible. And then we have the presence of the Lord. But I like to go into this issue of the presence of God. Psalms, Psalms uh, 139, uh, Psalms. Psalms 139, and uh, look at verse 7. 
whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And so the presence of God is his spirit. And so when we talk about Genesis chapter 3, the presence of the Lord, what were they hiding from? They were hiding from the spirit of the Lord. Now, that is something that we ought to think about. And the voice of the Lord was walking. Now, this thought of the voice of the Lord walking, let us go to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That is the action, moving, walking. And so we find that it is the Spirit of the Lord that was moving upon the face of the waters. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we find that it is the voice of the Lord walking. And so the, the, the Spirit of the Lord walking or moving upon the waters is the same as the voice of the Lord God walking. And it is the same as the presence of the Lord God. Now, um, if sin had separated man from God, and this is what was happening in Genesis chapter 3 after sin, then we ask ourselves, really, what does the Bible say was happening? And uh, really what happened in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. When you go to John, John chapter 1 verse 1, you find that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so uh, this word, the thought of God expressed or made audible should be the one actually or should be the presence of the Lord or Christ manifesting the presence of God in Genesis chapter 3 to do a work of mediation because we are told that um, um, in 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And so Christ came in the garden of Eden, one as the voice of the Lord, and number two, as the presence of God and Number three, as the mediator between God and man. That is basically what I understand is happening in the book of Genesis chapter three after sin, because we are told sin had separated man with God and they could not have a direct communion or communication. In uh, Zechariah chapter six, verse um, 13, uh, Zechariah, Sorry, the book of uh, Zechariah 6.13. Uh, this is what we read. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And so what we find in Genesis chapter 3 is the council of peace happening between uh, them both now happening between them both what does that mean between the father and the son the council of peace is happening but what is this all peace about christ has pledged that uh, he shall redeem the world and so there must be a council of peace between the father and the son on how the world will be redeemed if there is sin and so as they have this council now the son is sent to be the mediator between man and God. And then that son, who is the word of God, the thought of God or the expression of God, uh, uh, visible or made audible, he's there carrying the presence of God and is the voice of God because his word is to be obeyed as the father himself. He comes there to mediate between man and God when there is sin. And so... Uh, my point is that after, the, after sin, God could not communicate and be seen by man anymore. But Christ was the mediator and we had the angels and we had the prophets. The gift that we are going to look at is the gift of uh, the prophets. This is the gift that we are looking at, the prophets and the gift itself. And so there was no communication. Uh, 
and as we have read in first timothy 2 5 for there is one god and one mediator between god and man man the man jesus christ who did moses aaron nadab abihu and 70 elders see in exodus 24 verse 9 then went up moses and aaron nadab and abi and 70 of the elders of israel and they saw God of Israel, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also they saw God, and did eat and drink. We are told, by God's appointment, this man had been entrusted with special honors. The had been of that number who, with the seventy elders, went up with Moses into the mountain and beheld the glory of God. They saw the glorious light which covered the divine form of Christ. The bottom of this cloud was in appearance like the paved work of a sapphire stone as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. These men were in the presence of the glory of the Lord and did eat and drink without being destroyed by the purity and unsurpassed glory that was reflected upon them. Now, this is not something strange because... Um, uh, several times God has manifested himself in different ways. And so when the Bible saw that they saw the God of Israel, it is that they were able to see the glory, the light, because we have been told that he is enshrouded with the light. If uh, you go to our earlier uh, verse, we read in uh, 1 Timothy 6.15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentant, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And so when we say in uh, Exodus chapter 24, verses 10, and they saw the God of Israel, yet... There are seeming contradiction that no one can see God, then it is uh, saying that he dwelleth in the light. And so what we can deduce and deduct and uh, 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 perfectly say is that um, they saw the form of God. They saw the light that surrounded the Lord, that form, that humanoid form. And uh, uh, it was under uh, uh, under his feet were like a caved uh, uh, a stone uh, that is sapphire stone and so uh, since communication in Isaiah 59 was broken between man and God Christ only could be the mediator and the angels could bring the message and the holy prophets could bring the message and so we are looking at number three the prophets and the gift and why the prophets, because the Lord has said, in the end time, we shall have a trouble, we shall have a crisis of many rising like as prophets, but then they will not uh, be true prophets. And so we need to check them if they are true prophets. And we saw that um, the only way to check on them, um, uh, the only way to check on them it was in Isaiah, in the book of Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. How do we know that these are true prophets? We saw that if any arises among us as a prophet, then the first thing, if he is to say that he has the gift, then that gift must be seen in um, its capacity perfecting the saints and you know that sanctify them by the truth uh, 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 um, thy word is the truth and so this is the perfection of the saints through the word of God and so if any prophet rises then his sole purpose will be seen in the fruits of the saints being perfected we shall see also that uh, in this prophet his main labor is the work of the ministry for the work of the ministry and the ministry for what for the church and not profiting himself and this prophet when he arises it is for the edifying of the body of christ and not edifying himself and also this prophet will uh, bring in unity he will endeavor to bring the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And then uh, we saw again that um, when we read earlier that um, uh, he will bring truth that uh, the children of God may not be tossed to and fro and carried with the winds of doctrine. So the doctrine that he will be having is the doctrine of Christ that will make the children of God uh, be able to settle into truth both intellectually and spiritually. That is the prophet and the gift. When a person arises to say that he is a prophet, we have to see these qualities that are being mentioned in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And not only the prophet, but also he gave some to the teachers, some to apostles, um, and uh, some to the ministers. And so narrowing down to the work of the prophet, we shall see that it is for perfecting of the saints. It is for the ministry of the church. It is for the unity of the church. It is for the knowledge of the Son of God. And then we see that um, he shall bring the truth, the true doctrine that uh, will make the children of God settle into truth, both spiritually and intellectually, that they may not be tossed about with the winds of doctrine. These are the qualities that we have to look in anyone rising to say that he has been given a gift by God. We are not just to accept anyone as a servant of God, if these qualities that has been revealed in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 are not being seen in their life. Another place that I would like us to be directed to is the book of um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy and uh, chapter uh, 13. It should be chapter 13. And look keenly at uh, the qualities of a prophet. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go what after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the prophet or that dream of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your souls. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. What are these commandments that are really uh, are connected with the prophet? It is the first commandment which tells us that um, there is one God who brought us out of Egypt. So the prophet has to be connected to the doctrine of this one God, which is the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20. And if this prophet doesn't lead us to obey the command, which is the first commandment, and that prophet or that dream of dream shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is repeated here. This is the first commandment. And so a true prophet will be connected with the message of the Lord that brought us out of Egypt, shall not lead the congregation to go to worship another God, not according to the commandment, which is the first commandment, and redeem you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way with the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from, uh, uh, from the midst of thee. Verse 6, if thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is in thine own soul, enters thee secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known thou or, thou or not thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are around about you, nigh unto thee or far from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal. And so you shall not hide him if he is a, a false prophet, but sh thou shalt reveal unto the people, this is not a true prophet. And so we are seeing the prophet and the gift. When um, the Lord gave the gift of tongues to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, 
they went about boldly declaring that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and teaching the things that Christ had commanded them to teach. That is why in the Great Commission, we are told, go into the world, teach and baptize, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you or given unto you, and lo, I am with thee till the end of the world. These are the things that has to be seen in a prophet who will arise amongst us, that uh, they have to adhere to the great commission that has been given in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. They should teach all the things that Christ taught. No prophet is supposed to teach anything that is not found in the teachings of Jesus Christ. What to say things that Christ taught the apostle is what they taught. No prophet can arise and teach another thing which is different from what Christ taught him, uh, taught his disciples. And so, uh, reason being, in First Corinthians, in the book of uh, First Corinthians, Chapter 14, verse 32, we read, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And so, a prophet cannot just arise today and say, I have a new thing. And then his spirit is not subject to other prophets. What does it mean to be subject? It has to be agreeable to what is canonical and what has been revealed in the word of God. For the spirit will not contradict god is not a god of confusion to start contradicting things we are looking at number three the prophet and the gift this man what is the spirit of that gift the spirit of that gift must be the spirit of other prophets and it should be the spirit of christ who went about and taught only what he saw the father uh, 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 or what he he heard from the father and so communication was severed and Christ was that prophet that uh, was able to communicate with uh, his children. So Adam in his innocence had enjoyed open communication, communion with his maker, but sin brought separation between God and man. And the atonement of Christ alone could span the abyss and make possible the communication uh, of blessing or salvation from heaven to earth. Man was still cut off from direct approach to his creator but God will communicate with him through Christ and angels. And so uh, we were looking at who did Moses, Aaron, and Nadab, and Abi, and 70 elders see. We have seen that no one has ever seen God, but God is uh, clothed with the light. And so what these people were able to see was the humanoid form of the light which surrounds the Lord Jesus Christ and is the light of uh, the Father. And so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, Jesus spoke with Moses in the burning bush, and we are looking at this light unapproachable, which formed the image of the Father, which cannot be seen by a sinful person. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see the great sight why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And uh, so we find that in this bush, there was the light that was manifested, which means that you could not see God and his form literally and physically and be able to live while still in this sinful nature and so there was the light that covered the bush that moses was able to hear the voice from and so even the 70 elders when we say that they saw the lord when the bible writes that they saw the lord they saw the light uh, of that humanoid humanoid form and so the humanity of the son of god is everything to us it is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. And so it was Christ at the burning bush and he was surrounded by the light, which actually is the light that he received from the Father.
And so in Exodus 19.9, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. The cloud that guided Israel stood over the tabernacle. The glory of cloud emanated from Christ. The glory of the cloud emanated from Jesus Christ, who from the midst of the glory talked with Moses as he had talked with him from the burning bush. It was Christ who amid thunder and flame had proclaimed the law upon Mount Sinai. Yet he who spoke to the people that day in essence of love was opening to them the principles of the law proclaimed upon Sinai. Now, in the book of Matthew chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 at the baptism of Jesus Christ. Remember, we are looking at the prophet and the gift that since man sin, there have been no direct communication between man and God. But God has spoken through Jesus. He has spoken through the angels and he has spoken through the prophets. And we are looking at the prophet because we know that Christ cannot lie. The angels cannot lie unless they are fallen angels and so we should be careful with angels too because we can be speaking to fallen angels and we saw that um, when they speak the son the angels and the servants it is for the perfecting of the saints it is for the knowledge of the son of god it is for the unity it is for the work of the ministry for the church and it is to settle the children of god uh, uh, in truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that they may not be tossed about with winds of doctrine. So it means that they'll have the doctrine of Jesus Christ and teaching everything whatsoever he taught the disciples. And so nothing else from what Christ taught can be accepted as the truth. In Matthew 3, 16 and, and 17, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so you find that uh, the voice of the Lord spoke from heaven. In Matthew 17, 45, then under Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, or Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him at the transfiguration. Now, repeating the same thing uh, of the transfiguration, Peter reports this in Second uh, Peter 1.16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fable when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased with. I am well pleased. And so you find this idea of the glory of the Lord being manifested through the Son in the Old Testament and directly during the earthly ministry of his Son, that that glory could be manifested and the voice of the Lord could be heard from um, a heaven. And so communication was still severe, but um, through his Son, he could manifest himself. At the temple, in John 12, 27 to 28, now is my soul troubled, Jesus says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The voice of God had been heard at the baptism of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and again at his transfiguration on the mount. Now at the close of his ministry, it was heard for the third time by a larger number of persons and under peculiar circumstances. You notice that. And so, uh, sorry. And so you find that uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, the 
sin entered into uh, the world, God has been communicating through the mediator, which is his son, and also through his angels. He, through angels in uh, Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 19, that is to Hagar, to Lord, to Abraham in Genesis 22, to Balaam in Numbers 22, to Elijah in First Kings uh, chapter 19, and to Daniel chapter 6, Zacharias. Uh, you can look uh, at the book of Luke chapter 1, and to Mary, Luke chapter 1, Joseph, Matthew chapter 1, women at the tomb, Luke 24, apostles in jail, Acts 5, Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, Peter in prison, Acts chapter 27. And the reason being, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And so we have proved that um, since sin, God has communicated through his son. And from the verses given, it is apparent that God has communicated to man through angels. Uh, and uh, you can revisit this slide and look at all these references um, you will be able to read for yourself and see that uh, God has spoken to angels, to man through uh, angels too. Now, God speaks through the gift of prophecy as we enter the most uh, uh, important segment of uh, this uh, foundation. Now, you will find that um, the very things that... Um, Jesus spoke at the very things that um, unfallen angels speak and the things that uh, those who receive the gift of prophecy shall speak, then they should be uh, the things that uh, are, uh, are in the Bible and tallies with uh, the message of Jesus Christ himself and then the and fallen angels. And so let us look at the prophets in the Bible, how God uses the prophets to communicate to his children. In the book of uh, Amos 3, 7, this is what we read. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so, when the message is revealed through the prophets, these prophets, we read one characteristic about them. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this is a very important point because the prophets are subject to the prophets. And the angels are prophets. You cannot miss that in Revelation chapter 19, 10. Angels are prophets. In simple terms, they have the gift of prophecy. And so what the earthly prophet will speak, what the human prophet will speak, have to agree with what the unfallen angels speaks because the gift is the same. The one who has given the gift is the same person. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, uh, talking about the gift of prophecy, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the work of working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another designing of spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all this worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. And so we find that um, the spirit that gives the different gifts is the same spirit that gives the spirit of prophecy. And so the prophets also will be subject to the other gifts manifested in the church. We cannot take an assumption that uh, the one who has the gift of prophet is uh, a major person is or or is unfailable person and his office is higher than the other gift in the chat i know in courts we look at it as the highest gift but um what will be the prophets 
of the gift of prophecy and prophets without other prophets, with, without other gifts, sorry. How will he be checked if we do not have the gift of discerning? How will he be checked if we don't have the gift of the teachers? How will this prophet be checked if we don't have others speaking in diverse tongues? And how will this prophet be checked if uh, uh, his office is so disconnected with the holy board, body of Jesus Christ, no gift of healing, uh, no working of miracles and other diverse gifts. There, there is no way that uh, this gift of, gift of prophecy will work among us without other gifts being manifested among us to keep in check this gift that is uh, uh, seemingly of the highest import. That is uh, how we can just uh, appreciate, love to appreciate the office of the gift of prophecy. It is when we have these other diverse gifts in the church. And so Romans 12, 6 says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And there's a place we can reach in the gift of uh, prophecy, and we cannot go beyond that. When a prophet arises to say that he has received a grace or a truth beyond that which has been revealed, then he is not prophesying according to the proportion of faith, according to the measure of faith that he has given, he has been given, but he is entering into the realm which is not his. And you may know that the one leading him is not the Lord God, but it is the fallen angels. The purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8, we saw that it is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and then for the unity, for the knowledge of the Son of God, and for settling the children of God into truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that they may not be tossed about with winds of uh, doctrine. Now, we are told, I point to the words of the Apostle Paul in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. This whole chapter is a lesson that God desires to learn and practice. In the fourth chapter of Ephesians, the plan of God is so plainly and simply revealed that all his children may lay hold upon the truth. Here, the means which he has appointed to keep unity in his church, that it is members may reveal to the world a healthy religious experience, is plainly explained. And how is this well plainly explained in the fourth chapter in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 we find that um, he gave gifts unto men and what are these gifts some apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers so all these offices must agree for the one that gives the diverse gifts is the same that gives the gift of prophets, gives particular gifts unto the church. And so all this must harmonize for the perfecting of the saints. And that is why we are told that uh, this whole chapter is a lesson that God desires to learn and practice because of one, here the means which he has appointed to keep unity in his church, that its members may reveal to the world a healthy religious experience, is plainly explained. And the church shall not come short of these gifts to guide them till the end of the age. But God has said in the church different gifts. These are all precious in their place and are all to act apart in the perfecting of the saints. That is why I'm saying they must agree. This is God's order and men must labor according to his rules and arrangements if they will meet with success. God will accept only those efforts that are made willingly and with humble hearts without the trait of personal feelings or selfishness manifested in Christian dismissation. The gift of prophecy were not limited in the old dispensation but also in the new dispensation. 
And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Um, the same thing Peter repeats in Acts chapter 2 verse 15. Partially the fulfillment of uh, what Joel predicted. We saw that um, it was partial because Joel says that after this they shall see signs in the sky and they shall see the, sun, the coming of uh, the Son of Man or the Son of God. This did not happen on the day of Pentecost, but it will receive its full fulfillment in the last day. So prophets in the New Testament, we find Simeon's prophecy in Luke chapter 2, prophetess Anna. And so the gift of prophecy is not only limited to men, but also women both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Then we have the prophets from Jerusalem, that is Agabus in Acts chapter 11, prophets in the church at Antioch, Acts chapter 13, Judas and Silas in Acts chapter 15, and Philip's daughters in Acts chapter 21. And so the gift of prophecy is not only limited in the Old Testament to men, but it is open to every testament, both in the old and in the new, both to men and uh, women for the benefit of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. And why for that uh group only for those that uh, uh, believe you know the gift of tongues is to prove to naysayers that really there is a power that uh, can work in men and women that is supernatural this one will prove to those believers and non-believers when they this is manifested where there is unbelievers they will be able to recognize this is beyond human power but then we are told the gift of prophecy is for the word, for those who believe. Why for those who believe? Because the gift of prophecy is for the edification of the church. And not only for the education of the church, but it mainly deals with doctrinal matters also, which only you can only teach doctrines to men who believe in Jesus Christ. You can teach doctrines to people who don't believe Jesus Christ. You can teach uh, the second coming. You can teach about heaven to people who don't believe. You only teach the people who believe. And so the gift of prophecy, actually, it works more for the edification of the church. Whereas also we find that it has a part in warning those who don't believe. But mainly this gift is for the benefit of uh, the church. The church has to be edified because it's like a light shining into dark places until the day dawn. That is the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And uh, until uh, the man of God be, becomes uh, perfect. And so it is essentially for the church. There are matters in the testimony that are written not for the world at large, but for the believing children of God. Now, just on this thought that uh, the gift of prophecy is mainly for the church, think about this. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, which are heavily prophetic books. Although we find that um, God in some way dealt with the Babylonians, but it was to bring unto them the knowledge of the Son of God, to bring to them the knowledge of the truth. But particularly the heaviest part of the book of Daniel deals with the restoration of the kingdom of God, which has to do with the children of God. The very last uh, uh, portion of those uh, prophecies in Daniel chapter 2, look at the stone in the book of Daniel chapter 2, look at Daniel chapter 3 at the end of it, what happens, and then you have in the book of Daniel chapter 4, that tree and how it is destroyed. You find Babylon in chapter 5, and then it's passed over, then, then you are having uh, 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 the beginning of uh, 
the saving of the children of God in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 7 and then the sanctuary message continuing until Daniel chapter 12. When you come to Revelation, it is the seven letters to the seven churches. That is what is mainly in the book of Revelation. And God deals with it until the end of the book itself. And it is mainly the gift of prophecy. It's mainly for the church. And the wicked can learn uh, what is God doing when the church fully appreciates this uh, gift. And so you will find that uh, mainly this gift is for the church. And so 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he may prophesy. For he that speaketh in a known tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in unto known tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesies edifieth the church despise not prophesying prove all things hold fast that which is good now when a prophet rises among us we have to prove because one of the things that um, was written in the letters to the churches is that um, you have tried them that said there are the jewish and there are the prophets but there are no and so that is how you find that uh, this gift of prophet, this gift, gift of prophecy cannot stand alone. It has to stand with the other gift. They have to keep in check this gift. If it is true, if it is working as it is revealed in the Bible, or it's not working according to how it should be in the Bible. And so we find that uh, despite not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to uh, which is good, uh, that which is good. The gift of prophecy is also God's voice to the church. Now, we read uh, in the beginning, 2 Peter 1 20 and 21, that uh, Knowing this fact that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but uh, holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this was the voice of God. The gift of prophecy is the voice of God in the church. And... Uh, also in the book of um, First Peter one twelve, I presume First Peter one verse twelve. Ah, uh, let me just look at this First Peter one verse um, eleven, not twelve. Searching what or what man of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. So actually the voice, the, the, the gift of the prophecy is the voice of Christ also because it is Christ through his spirit signifying in them and testifying beforehand that which shall be. So the gift of prophecy is the voice of God. Holy men spoke as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And also the men such these things and the Spirit of Christ signified in them beforehand what shall be. And so the gift of prophecy is the voice of God and also it is the voice of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, if that be the case, that this is the voice of God and this is the voice of Jesus Christ, then it has to speak only what it hears the Father speak. It has to teach only what Christ taught and not to do away with everything that Christ has done and bring in 
a whole new thing that is startling uh, to the people. And so the prophet is an agent, a messenger sent by God. The prophet is but an agent to bring a message. The important is in the message, not the messenger per se. The message is God's voice to men, and the messenger is symbol, the agent selected of God through whom to send the message. The messenger is entirely human and liable when not under divine control to err. The message is divine and safeguarded from error by God. And so when these men speak, under divine inspiration, they are representing God. If they are not speaking under direct divine inspiration, then they are not speaking for God and they are liable to err. They are liable to err. Uh, how can the church appreciate this gift? How can the church appreciate this gift? This is some. Um, the part that is going to bring us to the last segment of this message as we end the last few minutes. How can the church appreciate this gift? And uh, I want to read something in the book of uh, Ezekiel, and then uh, I'll be able to read something in the book of uh, uh, Isaiah and other places, how we can appreciate this gift. First of all, allow me to start with the book of uh, Isaiah. How do we come to appreciate the gift and even to know that uh, this gift is being manifested in us? Isaiah chapter 8 verses 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we can only appreciate this gift when it is to the law and to the testimony. And so it has to agree with the law. And then we shall know really God is visiting his children. When Prophets and teachers stand in the church of God to give the message from God and it agrees to the law. Then we can appreciate this gift and we can really know that we are being edified and God has remembered his children and he is leading them into the right path. And for we know that... Um, one of the reasons that God sends the gift of prophet in the church is to comfort the church. When the enemy seems to assail them so much, the Lord sends the gift of prophecy to comfort them because Christ is the spirit of comfort and the Father is the spirit of comfort. Of comfort. And so from them, through the prophets, we shall get the comfort and uh, admonition, rebuke, and encouragement to be uplifted in our journey in this narrow pathway. In the book of Ezekiel 7, 26, mischief shall come upon mischief and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and cancel from the ancient, the ancients, the Gentiles. And so the reason why God brings actually the visions or the gift of the prophet or prophets is um, uh, for the church to be comforted, as I said, and uh, to uh, be able to bring back to the track the priests in the churches. For the gift of the prophet points people back to the law of God, has to point people back to the word of God. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, we are looking how, ca how, how can we appreciate this gift? Uh, how important is it to us? Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. And so you find that uh, the gift of the prophet is tied to the law. It brings people back to the law of God, to the revealed will of God. And if the people were being led astray, 
by any other gift in the church. The work of the gift of the prophets is to bring back to the people to the law and to the word of God. This is how we appreciate. This is how it helps the church and comforts the church because it is the only gift that tends to lead people back to the word of God when they are re-airing or when they are being led astray. And that is uh, that means that um, this gift is uh, of much importance. To Lamentation 2.9, her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. And so again, you are seeing how the gift of the prophet is tied to the law of God. And, you know, many a times we limit the law of God to the Ten Commandments. This is not the totality of the law of God. The law of God is the totality of what comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so the scripture are the law of God. They are his word that the prophet needs to point people back to. And so the gift, the prophets and the gift. Again, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, think not I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. You see that uh, once a prophet will be amongst us, the people will appreciate the written word of God. Once a prophet is amongst us, he shall lead the people to search the word of God more and not to search after anything else. And that, that is how important this gift is. And because we are looking at the series, the prophets, we shall see that every prophet that has risen in any generation, any true prophet has led back people to the word of God and not guided them to another truth, which is, are not revealed in the word of God. And we shall be testing the non-canonical prophet and uh, the prophets that shall arise among us if they will stand by the bar of what is written about the uh, prophets. Again, in John 1, 45, Philip founded Nathaniel and said unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law, Moses is the prophet and the prophets. So, Moses is seen as the law and is seen as the prophet in another way, which means that this office of the law and the, uh, the prophet is one thing. Acts 13, 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophet, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And so the prophets are to read from the law. The prophets are to exhort the people of God. And so this is again we, what we shall see again and again in Acts 24 verse 14 we are told but this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy so worship I the God of my fathers believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Romans 3 21 but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets and so uh we find that uh, uh the gift of uh, or the office of uh, the prophets when it is manifested to the church as we have seen it will lead back the people to the written word of God. And so the prophets and the gift, what do we learn from this about um, the prophets and the gift? This is what we have to learn, that um, the gift of the prophets is subject unto the prophets, which means it does not teach something which is different from what other prophets taught. The gift also 
it is for the comforting of the child. The prophet doesn't stand on his own, but he stands uh, as a representative, as a messenger, as an angelos for God. And because God is in the ministry of reconciling men unto himself, when the communication broke, he used Jesus Christ. And then Christ is using the prophets just to do the same work the Father is doing through him. And so the prophets and the servants of God share in the office of Jesus Christ because Christ is a prophet, Christ is a priest, and Christ is a king. You find that the prophets share in this office of the prophets and in this office of the priest. And uh, uh, that is what we find that uh, we are in the ministry of reconciliation. That is the work of the priest per se. But as uh, the prophet comes to the church and leads the people back to the word of God, leads people back to uh, a victory over sin, leads people back to the comfort that they need in God, you find that he is in the same way doing the ministry of reconciliation, which is sharing in the priesthood. And so this gift is a, 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 a most uh, precious gift into the church because uh, when it's given to the church, we see that uh, it is like a light shining into dark places until the day dawn, bringing perfection, unity, uh, 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 settling the people into truth, both spiritual and intellectual. And so I just pray that we shall appreciate this prophet this office and not only that but if anyone arises amongst us to proclaim that he has the gift we shall go back to the law we shall go back to the word of god and see if these things are so and so i pray that we may continue learning together may the lord bless you and may the lord bless us may he continue reproving us through the voices of his servants admonishing us and comforting us until we see the Lord in the clouds of the air. Shall we uh, pray? Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you give us a message beforehand so that when a crisis comes, Lord, that, that people may be thoroughly furnished unto good works and unto the knowledge that can help them to stand in the day of peril. And so this gift that you have put in the church, help us to appreciate it, but also examine it and test it and to take that which is good and uh, discard with that which is not good. May the name continue to be praised. Bless your children, wherever they are, and those who will come in contact with this information. May it be a stepping stone to studying more about how we can know this is a true or a false prophet. They will continue to be done on earth here as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name, amen. So until we meet again, may the Lord be with us and may God bless us. Bye for now.